Yeah, we've talked about this. We've talked about this a lot, but okay, I need to go a little bit rant mode for you. I hope you can tolerate it. I want to talk about DxO Mark and why why do we need to talk about them, right? Okay, look, I don't really care what DxO Mark thinks of smartphone cameras, okay? In their ranking scheme of how phones go, I disagree with how they rank them. I also disagree with the format in which DxO Mark rates cameras and their quality. I think from the start, the core idea of trying to assign a single number to a smartphone camera is bound to cause controversy because all smartphone cameras these days are getting so close in different areas, both with color and contrast and sharpness and brightness. They're all getting so similar with features that I think the idea of boiling it all down to a single number encourages people to get upset. It encourages media outlets to post things, which I think was the whole reasoning behind it. You know, if we on DxOMark boil down smartphone cameras to a single number, it's kind of as controversial as Rotten Tomatoes for movies. It's not a real accurate way to rate a movie to just give it a yes or no rating. We've all seen movies that we've felt eh, about and that we've hated and that we've loved. The idea that you can boil down a movie to a score out of 100 is quite outlandish and very subjective. And no, I get that they're not doing that with the Exo Mark. They have an elaborate scheme of tests and a bunch of benchmarks they put their cameras through in order to boil down this exact score. And I've seen other YouTubers like MKBHD talk about the reasoning behind these scores and how they get to these numbers. And while other YouTubers have been explaining them, I would humbly like to throw in my two cents and say, I don't agree with this rating scheme because I think it is biased from the start. And I think DxO Mark rating systems apply much better to DSLR cameras and it doesn't really work in the smartphone industry. So the reason I thought this was worth talking about is a lot of people are discussing the fact that the iPhone 10 scored a 97, literally one point behind the Google Pixel 2. But of course, there's a lot more to this because you're rating both photo and video. And if you look at the harsh numbers within the DxO Mark review, is we find out that the iPhone 10 actually got the highest score ever for photography. So for still images, in DxOMark's research have discovered that the iPhone 10 is in fact the best smartphone camera for taking pictures. Whereas the Pixel 2 had a bit more of a lead because of its performance in videography. Now, as other YouTubers have mentioned, and I do also encourage this, you really should take a look at the harsher numbers. Don't look at just the top end score number because that's really an inefficient way of rating smartphone cameras. And I actually kind of disagree with the idea at all of boiling it all down to a single number because I think that there's so much subjectivity between preference and so many drastically different features between both Galaxy phones, iPhones, and Pixel phones that trying to break them all down on the same scale is really inefficient and the true reason we're talking about DxO Mark right now is not because everyone looks at them for smartphone quality. They are the king. They are the one who decides what makes or breaks a smartphone camera. That's not true. We didn't really talk about this until the Google Google Pixel came out and my issue with it is that when Google advertises the Pixel, which yeah, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know I'm not a fan of it. I know a lot of Android users aren't a fan of it, but a big complaint I have with the Pixel is that they post the tagline, the highest rated smartphone camera. And I think that's quite an outlandish statement. And especially when the only company that is giving you its highest rating ever is a company you worked with and actually paid for. For those of you who don't know, for a fee, you can pay DxO Mark and they will work with your hardware team and tell you how to get the highest score on their rating site. So I find that incredibly biased and I think there's a ton of bias to that tagline that they very quickly throw out the window. So my biggest issue with kind of the chart here, so when you scroll to the very, very bottom, see they kind of make it hard to find, of the smartphone camera test on DxO Mark, you found the breakdown chart of what is most important in a smartphone camera and ranked all the way down to what is least important. My issue with DxO Mark is that they put things that I don't think are super important at the very, very top and they put a ton of things that I think make the extreme difference at the very bottom. So for instance, for photography at the very, very bottom of the chart where things don't matter the most, they have both zoom and bokeh. For those of you who don't know, bokeh is those blurred portrait shots that we're now seeing in most smartphones. With the iPhone 10, we have it on the front facing camera and rear facing camera. Same with the Pixel 2 and with the Galaxy Note 8, we have a telephoto lens. See, I think this is a very popular thing. And I think most people buying smartphones are not putting them through these rigorous tests where DXO Mark points them at a billion different colors and zooms in on each individual photograph and compares the pixel quality. That's not what average smartphone users do. In fact, I don't think that's what any smartphone users do is get them out and they point them at the exact same thing and compare all of the artifacts and the noise. Instead, what they have at the top of actually both photography and videography on the DxO Mark chart is exposure and contrast. Now, I understand why they think that's important because it's, you know, lighting, I get it. But at the same time, when you even look 
down the chart and you see Pixel 2, Note 8, iPhone 10. You look at the different contrasts, there's not a terrible difference. So we got a picture here from the iPhone 10 and then we've got a picture here from the Pixel 2 and you're like, okay, we can still see the, the, the different coloring. We can still see that the, this is a picture. Maybe the Pixel 2 gets them a little more accurately. Oh wait, it doesn't. I just showed you the same picture twice and you probably were staring at it trying to find those minute differences to tell me the Pixel gets this more accurate. All you really have to do is go into the Photos app, hit edit, edit the brightness settings a little bit, and then the computer adjusts them. And all I'm trying to say is that the top of the line flagships this year all kind of have color, they have contrast, pretty much tied. I don't think anyone's going to buy a Pixel 2 over an iPhone because they saw a little bit more lighting in the shadows. And if anything, keep in mind, I don't hate the Pixel 2 camera. I'm not a fan of the phone itself, but I actually think that the Pixel 2 camera is very, very good. I love that the camera is on a pretty cheap phone and using software, they're able to create portrait shots, both on the rear and facing camera. I'm impressed by that. And if anything, I would say that the Pixel 2 is better at taking stills based on the ones I've seen, whereas the iPhone 10 is better at taking video. But instead, DxOMark, through their extensive research, has determined that the Pixel 2 is better at taking video because of all these features like color, autofocus, texture, noise, artifacts, exposure and contrast. And then at the very, very bottom, at the least of importance, we have stabilization, actually scoring higher than the iPhone 10, even though the iPhone 10 has two lenses on the back that are optically stabilized. Now, I don't know about you, but of the people I know who buy smartphones and love to take pictures with them, color and contrast is not a giant thing that's typically compared to. You know, you can show a picture from the Note 8 and compare it to the iPhone 10, and you're like, ah, eh, iPhone 10 may be a little more saturated, or maybe even the Note 8 is a tad more saturated. It just depends on the situation. What I do notice, though, is people at concerts, people recording children's plays, people trying to take pictures of birds far away, people taking pictures at theme parks, trying to take pictures in videos, of things far away, in which case having a telephoto lens does make quite the difference. You have a second 4K sensor. Now with the iPhone 10, we have that second sensor that is optically stabilized. And I must have to say, you know, I haven't done the iPhone 10 review yet. The telephoto lens being stabilized is definitely noticeable. It's almost freaky stable. How like all of your hand shakiness, like I have shaky hands and all of the movements just go away because this telephoto lens has been optically stabilized. And the fact that the Pixel 2 team just as we can make a bokeh effect with software, we don't need a telephoto lens. I look at that as an extreme disadvantage because on the Pixel 2, you've only got your one sensor. And I also think something that even DxOMark should bring up is that when photographers are taking pictures and they're trying to have a narrow depth of field, if you're trying to take a professional looking picture, you're typically zooming it in. There are of course wide angle lenses for photographers, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, if you're looking at most college graduation pictures or high school graduation pictures, or if you're looking at your class photo, photos of back in elementary school when a photographer came to the school and take pictures when you're going for that narrow depth of field and that's what portrait shots are trying to do they're trying to focus on one thing and blur the background you're typically zooming in most photographers are using lenses that are more mid to telephoto than they are wide angle and I'm very impressed that the pixel team is able to make portrait shots just with software and they don't need the telephoto lens but I'm saying from a photographer's point of view you're better off taking pictures that are telephotoed as in what I'm trying to say is the portrait mode shots taken from an iPhone 10 because they're taken with the telephoto lens look more professional than that of a wide angle lens trying to blur more stuff because when you take pictures with a wide angle you're trying to capture more things but at the same time when you're taking a portrait shot you're trying to focus on a single subject which means that when you take portrait shots with a pixel 2 you're getting more blurred area what essentially I'm trying to say is that the pixel 2 is really great at taking macro shots like things that are close up in that case having a wide angle portrait shot is helpful but most people aren't doing that most people are taking portrait shots of people they like or animals or the most common scenario I've seen is just pictures of friends and family. That's what portrait shots look good at. They look at them and go, wow, a smartphone took that? That's incredible. And when you limit all that to a wide angle, it definitely just means that more of your shot is blurry. But of course, telephoto lenses, and of course, not to even mention video recording speeds are not even mentioned at DxOMark. So according to them, the Pixel 2 is better for videography, right? And what is not as good at videography is both the Galaxy Note 8 and the iPhone 10, which both have dual cameras on the back with optical stabilization, which means that on the iPhone 10 and the Note 8, you can zoom in twice as far, still have optical stabilization and not lose any pixels. And on the iPhone 10, we have video recording rates of 4K at 60 frames a second. That's twice as many frames as what the Pixel 2 can do. We also have 1080p at 240 frames a second, something the Pixel 2 does not even come close to. That's an insane amount of data that thanks to the A11 Bionic chip is 
possible on the iPhone 10. But again, those incredible frame rates, those incredible resolutions that the iPhone 8 and 10 are capable of recording at, not brought up. I haven't been following it, but I know that the Note 8 via software update is either close to getting 4K at 60 or it already has it. I apologize, I don't know at the moment. And I also just find it confusing that the Note 8 camera, which has a telephoto lens, incredible capabilities of being able to take both the telephoto portrait shot and the wide angle shot at the same time, is an extreme advantage. Not to mention the iPhone 8 and 10 have all of the different lighting options when you take a portrait shot, which again, are not brought up in DxO Mark. DxO Mark looks at the wide angle lens, the standard lens you have available, and compares basically nothing else. Not video frame rates, not photography features like different lighting options, or being able to, on the Note 8, look at portrait shots live as you're trying to take them, which in a way I think is almost approaching the ability to have portrait video. I think we're a long ways away from that, but it shows that via software that may be possible someday. It's just ridiculous to use DxO Mark as a rating system for your smartphone cameras, because I think that they look at how good the Pixel camera is at being the Pixel camera, whereas they're not considering all of the extra features a Galaxy Note phone offers or the iPhone offers. If I were ranking smartphone cameras right now, and believe me, I'm trying not to be too Apple sheep about this. I can't deny the fact that I'm biased towards Apple, but I'm also just trying to bring up harsh facts. I'd put iPhone 10 at the top because of the past few days I've been testing the cameras with it. The fact that I could take portrait shots on the front and rear facing. I have 4K at 60, I have 1080 at 240. I have a telephoto lens that's optically stabilized. I would put that at the top. I put the Galaxy Note 8 based on the videos and pictures I've seen it take, which have looked incredible, not to mention its live viewing features. I would put that slightly below the iPhone 10 just because it's lacking certain video frame rates, at least at launch. So I'd give like the iPhone 10 a 98, I'd give the Note 8 a 97. Below that, I would provide the iPhone 8 Plus because it takes great portrait shots, but it doesn't have the portrait mode on the front facing. And under that, I would add the Pixel 2 probably, just because it's a great camera, sure. It's great that, yeah, Pixel team, you can have optical image stabilization. We've known, we've had it since the iPhone 6 Plus. The fact that it lacks a dual camera, which no Google, the portrait mode option is not the only reason we have a dual camera, ask Samsung. They had the portrait mode option on the S8, but they still added a dual camera to the Note 8 because having that telephoto lens adds more options. I hope that makes sense to you guys. And yes, I'm sure that there's other smartphone cameras out there like the HTC or the Mate 10 or whatever. I've seen the other cameras on the chart. I'm sure they're great cameras. All I'm trying to say is the very idea of boiling down a smartphone camera to a single number is going to be controversial from the start. There's not really a great way to take it. Like you can ask media outlets and you can ask the press to be more analytical and to look at the harsh numbers. They're not going to do that. That's why DxO Mark puts a number at the top. And I don't think Google, you should call your smartphone camera the highest rated when you are paying the review company who is rating your phone. Just put, it's the highest phone DxO Mark has ever rated. And just let the record show, in my experience, iPhone 10's best camera I've ever used. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I will see you in the next one.